Okay, I'm going to start. I like to be on time. I appreciate all of you showing up and being a participant in this uh, Virginia Woolf uh, discussion today. There is a chat side, uh, some chat there. You can make comments on the side if you so desire. Uh, I'm going to do a little intro to this uh, to talk a little bit about Virginia Woolf from what I my point of view and we'll open it up to discussion. And then when we do that, you want to just make sure you mute. Uh, you mute yourself when you're not speaking. <coughs> Excuse me. I uh, want to thank everybody. This is a time to talk session. Um, and Mrs. Dalloway, this event is produced by Time and Space Limited here in Hudson, New York. Today, the tech part of this event is supported by TSL's general manager, Jeff Marks. I want to thank him. And as part of our event, we're going to show you a pre-recorded performance uh, which has been prepared and edited by TSL's Kevin Gilligan, uh, which features Claudia Bruce, my longtime collaborator and co-director of TSL, reading a portion of Mrs. Dalloway. So to go on now, I'm uh, certainly not an expert. I have a passion for Virginia Woolf and just will share that with you today and hope we can become even more passionate with our celebration of this amazing writer. She was born in 1882 and died in 1941. Uh, nearly five decades have passed since I first read Virginia Woolf. I was awed by her genius and innovation and still am. She liberated me from so many things, but as I look back today, uh, so much has changed, including me. Now I'm more aware of the history and the place of this great writer's work having been uh, uh, visited last night uh, by many thoughts and interruptions of my sleep, it's occurred to me that today it's impossible to say all that needs to be said about Virginia Woolf and her importance to many of our lives. Literature is key to living and words last. Mrs. Dalloway was published in 1925 and signaled the birth of stream of consciousness. Virginia broke the rules of the narrative with this book and this interior journey, which takes place on a day in June with Clarissa Dalloway has become a major literary work. As we near the hundred year celebration of the publishing of Mrs. Dalloway, I want to place the work in time and space. I want to place this work, for example, 1914 to 1918, World War I, a war that used artillery, small arms, poison gas, trench warfare as tools of war, killing and wounding over a million British soldiers. In 1915, Gandhi returns to India, marking the beginning of the end of British colonial rule. 1918 to 1920, the Spanish flu epidemic killed millions. In 1916, the birth, in 1916, the birth of Dada, a movement in art that brought radical changes to music, dance, literature, theater, and art. Names such as Duchamp, Schwitters, Satie, Nijinsky, Balb, Arp, Breton, Dali, and more emerged. These creative people are seeing a world through another lens, often fractured and non-narrative. Music of Schomburg developed a 12-tone technique, for example, and Eric Satie's music was the dawn of minimalism. Ballet was liberated by Nijinsky. Theater was assaulted by Alfred Jarry's Ubura. And the visual arts looked more like the casualties of World War I. Artist images were busted, shredded, grotesque, and abstract. Well into the 1900s, homosexual activity remained illegal and punishable by imprisonment. 1921, Wittgenstein wrote the Tractatus saying language is vague and when we and what we mean is never certain. And the essential work of words is to assert or deny facts. The world of philosophy was upended by this work. Early in 1900s, John Maynard Keynes, Virginia Woolf's friend and member of the Bloomsbury Circle, brought major changes to economics. Keynes' radical idea said government should spend money to mitigate recessions and depressions of post-World War I giving birth to ideas such as FDR's New Deal here in America. So now to begin again, for many of Wolf, 
For many, Wolfe's Mrs. Dalloway by far exceeds James Joyce's Ulysses. Joyce takes us on a journey too, a day in the life of Leopold Bloom. Wolfe was aware of James Joyce's book. She wrote to T.S. Eliot that she had read 200 pages and quit reading it. Never did any book so bore me, she said. She then returned to reading Proust's Remembrance of Things Past. There's so much to say in so little time. Just an aside, Virginia Woolf was key to the feminist movement with her book called A Room of One's Own. Declaring that women need their own space was the beginning of, women's, of women gaining a place in the man's world for my generation. For me, Virginia Woolf is a major influence in my work as a director and writer for the theater. I've produced three events around Woolf's writing. 1974, 1976, and 78, I used sections from the waves and the moment. Wolf's language is, for me, perfect for the stage. So back to Mrs. Dalloway. Clarissa reflects past, present, and future, just like now. As we are forced to be in her position to reflect on our lives as the pandemic of the 21st century now visits us, and pushes us into our own self-exploration, it is a perfect time to reconsider the importance of this book and Virginia Woolf as we change, so does this re revisiting of Mrs. Dalloway. So I wanna open the discussion now. We have many people who have come to know and love Virginia Woolf as I have, uh, and I wanna let you all participate and speak and let's have a lively and exciting discussion. Please just join in, and uh, if you're not speaking, on you know, mute yourself. If you want to speak, jump in. Any jumpers? <laughs> so I know we have Dr. Drummon, drummer on the call here. Good afternoon, Linda. Thank you. Um, it's great to be with you all. Um, seeing this discussion um, in your flyer um, made my heart sing because I am also a Virginia Woolf devotee. I did my doctoral dissertation on Virginia Woolf. Um, I hadn't thought about Mrs. Dalloway in, in, a, in a while. I've read it many, many times, but um, because of today's discussion, I started looking at it through a new lens. And that lens is that the 1918 Spanish flu really influenced the writing of this book, the collision actually of the 1918 Spanish flu and the end of World War I come together in a very unique way. I had never, I had never thought about this perspective and now that the pandemic that we're facing is upon us, it's really given me new insights into this, this novel. But when you think about Clarissa's going out in London to, you know, do her, get by the flowers herself. There's such meaning in that because it's such a small thing, but yet what she's talking about is having been ill herself during the, the Spanish flu. And suddenly she has the liberation to be out and about in London that of course culminates in her party where she's bringing all of these people together and how much we are all looking forward to that event in our own lives where we can actually get together again with people and, and socialize. Um, but, you know, as obviously in the middle of that party, you know, she learns about Septimus Warren Smith's death. So World War I collides with, you know, the party, you know, it all just comes together in a really incredible package for me. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm just in awe of the fact that when I first studied this book, like, like Linda, I was, you know, it was more than 50 years ago and um, no one ever mentioned the Spanish flu. You know, we knew from the beginning that Clarissa had had some kind of illness that, you know, she had turned white, I believe, you know, Wolf writes about Clarissa that, you know, since her illness, but it was never ever brought up, you know, about what, what the, the Spanish flu meant and, and how that had permeated London life. And I also did not realize that the bells told every time someone died from the, from the Spanish flu. So when you're reading that part about Big Ben, you know, and the, the leaden circles in the air, it takes on a completely different meaning 
you know, for me, the first time I read it, I thought it was just marking the passage of time, but much more involved, you know, with, with what was going on in the flu. So I just, I'm just in awe of the fact that, you know, I'm looking at this book now, <laughs> more than 50 years after the first time I read it, you know, with a completely different perspective. No, and I think you're absolutely right. This is a major work of World War I. Uh, and I don't think people think much about that until now. Uh, I see Kim Barkey's on there. Kim, you want to chime in? Hi, sorry, I don't have on my video. Um, I was in the middle of finishing my um, my lunch, which when I finish, I'll, I'll get on video so I can see everybody. Um, but yeah, I know I saw this come through the email and I was so excited. Um, you, uh, Linda and Claudia introduced me to Virginia Woolf when I was um, a young mother living in Ghent. And because I was a um, biochemistry major, I really had a lot of um, humanities work to catch up on. So I started uh, my adventure with Virginia Woolf at TSL and reading um, to the lighthouse, which totally blew my mind. Um, the, 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 cent the center of the story being the passage of time, um, which she illustrates so amazingly with no, no characters except the house itself. And um, it's all done through description. I, I still think about that particular piece when I think about my own writing now. And um, and I guess, you know, as far as Mrs. Dalloway, one of the things that I that I think about, I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying this connection to uh, <clears throat> to the pandemic that we're going through right now. I hadn't really thought about that either. <clears throat> but one of the things that I always think about when I think about Mrs. Dalloway is this this idea of consciousness and you know sort of what um, what is consciousness? Is it you know is it a um, is it a force like gravity outside of ourselves that we're able to you know, to tap into at times and, and share, you know, something with other people or with trees or who knows, right. Um, and the reason I think about that in that in that particular book, too, is, you know, is because of her, the way that it's written where these two characters lives are interwoven. Um, it makes me feel like there's a small like there's some, some seepage, let's say, you know, like, um, seepage seepage of consciousness between these two beings that we're that we're given an opportunity to experience as we read through the novel so anyway <laughs> those are my thoughts no, i think that uh, the idea of since it is the stream of consciousness that style of writing that relationship between things that are not our disparate parts are constantly coming together uh, Septimus ruins her party and they never even met. Uh, Diane Young, you got something you want to contribute? See you out there. Carla, anybody? I'd like to say something. So, Donna. Hi. Really? Hi, everybody. It's great to see, see you all. Um, thank you so much, uh, Linda, for celebrating Virginia Woolf. Um, like other people here, I've studied her for years, taught her for many years at William Patterson University. And I want to talk a little bit about my experience teaching Virginia Woolf. Um, she's a tough sell to undergraduates, I have to say, um, particularly a book like To the Lighthouse. But the most successful book was usually Mrs. Dalloway. And I think that was because of a number of things, certainly the Septimus Smith character, um, because he is a victim of shell shock. You know, he has been victimized by war. Um, and also, also the, the, the lesbian theme, you know, the fact that um, the great love of, of Clarissa Dalloway's life was a woman in a way, you know, and, and the way that's sort of accepted in the book. Um, um, I also want to talk, I just want to mention that stream of consciousness, the term, which is always used about James Joyce, was originally used by the critic Mae Sinclair when she was talking about Dorothy Richardson, 
who was an important precursor of Virginia Woolf and is sort of unknown. Um, but Pointed Roofs, Dorothy Richardson's first book came out in 1915 um, and influenced many, many writers, including Woolf. Um, so Woolf was part of a stream of women, sort of women writers and experimenting too. I think the mistake is to think of stream of consciousness as about Joyce or Proust or whatever, but I think the women in a way got a purer sense of, of the way consciousness flows. Um, so it's a wonderful book and I look forward to the rest of the talk. I think really good points. I, I think, uh, you know, there is, I think there was an article by Cunningham in the New York Times celebrating Joyce and then uh, Carolee just sent me the counter to that. Well, oh no, James Joyce was first. I mean, you know, we have to wait so long to get to Molly Bloom before we have a good time. It's just, it's the difference between how two people handle stream consciousness. Uh, I also think uh, Clarissa's daughter, you know, frustrates Clarissa because she's hanging out with this uh, unusual character who is not certainly, uh, you know, is a radical in another direction that Clarissa can't quite deal with that and is critical of her friend. Mm -hmm. And one might say, oh, well, this is another kind of lesbian uh, subtext. I'm not sure, I'm not an authority on this book, that's for sure. Uh, but I do think the, the lesbian issue definitely for women like myself who were looking for writers that certainly spoke to us, Virginia Woolf did uh, include us. And that was part of, uh, you know, clinging on to someone that, that, that was writing for a new a new reader like ourselves who we waited, we had to wait a while, of course, uh, to meet her. So anybody else out there got something they wanna put on the table? This is Brendan Quinn, how are you? Hey, Brendan, nice to see you. Yeah, I, I have an old copy of Mrs. Dalloway that I picked up at some used bookstore. I bought a new one for this time when I read it, I had this cool map in it. I don't know if anybody has this edition, but it shows you all. <laughs> no, I don't have that one. <laughs> it shows you all this uh, sites and spots that they, you know, the various people go to during the course of the story. But uh, you know, sadly, uh, you know, I was an English major, you know, in the seventies at University of Buffalo, which had a you know great reputation at that time, still does, but there were some serious, serious uh, heavyweights there. Uh, but Virginia Woolf, I, I can re sort of remember that it was a, that she was around, you know, but it was strictly for for women, for girls, you know, uh, you know that that's who took those courses, and it, it's just so it it, uh, it was so it's so sad that I never read her back then. But then again, I get to discover her now, which is good, you know, forty years down the road, and it's really through Cunningham that I get there. I never have seen the hours. I've never read the hours. Okay, uh, but knowing that it was out there caused me. To, that started paying attention to Virginia Woolf. And I, I like uh, Cunningham's book about Provincetown. I don't know if you ever read that. No, <laughs> he walks around Provincetown, it's really good. Uh, but I never read The Hours. But through that and just knowing it was out there, I started reading uh, Virginia Woolf uh, to the Lighthouse Orlando. This one I've read twice now. And you know, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot, she wrote a lot, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there. And you know, this is my favorite book of hers that, that I've read so far. Uh, and this time, I, I don't know if it's just because I read it the second time, but initially I had a hard time following what was going on, first, my first reading. This time, I, it was much, uh, I was much better at following it, and as a consequence, you know, I enjoyed it a lot more, I think. I really did enjoy it this time. Um, and... Uh, And it's just, there's just so much going on in such a, a small, you know, compressed, you know, I mean, it's only 150 pages, 160 pages long, and, and so much happens in, in the course of a day. And I, you know, people have, you know, um, I, of Irish descent, people talk about Joyce, I, wrote, I read Joyce, but I've never been able to connect to Ulysses, never. You know, I sort of agree, I'm bored by it, like she was, I guess. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, you know, all my friends, you know, not all of them, but several of them rave about Ulysses, the greatest book ever. I, I, I've never completed it uh, and I probably never will, you know, but <laughs> I, I love this book.
but when I read Wolf, it's always tempered. There's always sadness knowing that she killed herself. You know, I, I and that always tempers my reading of her. Like, why? You know, why did she do that? You know, uh, and that that really has nothing to do with the book, but it's sort of like is it over the whole. Uh, you know, my whole approach to her is this sadness that that she did commit suicide, you know, at a fairly young age, you know, 58 or so, I think she was, and certainly not ancient. Uh, but, you know, she had her reasons, I'm sure. But, you know, that 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 sadness, you know, permeates my reading of her, my appreciation of her. And, you know, there's obviously a lot of sadness in this book, you know, just on its surface and, 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 and its steps too. So, thank you. Comment about, I mean, she certainly uh, saw World War I and many of her friends would probably have been, <clears throat> excuse me, a victim of that war. And I think the coming of World War II probably uh, was overwhelming as well, just in terms of placing it in a time. She was also uh, reading the memoirs of, help me out here, Claudia, Mar. Marbeau, who was uh, Napoleon's general, was part of the Napoleonic Wars. So there's a definite uh, relationship between one, Napoleon, and then when you think about when she did eventually kill herself, it was the dawning of the Second World War. And I know, uh, Carol Lee, you have uh, written about Wolf and grief. So you might want to chime in there. Yeah, thank you. Um, and th this was just, just my theory. Um, Virginia lost so many loved ones, you know, at a very tender age, you know, she lost her mother, she lost her dad, she lost her brother, Toby. Um, my, my thesis is about how she uses her writing to work through her grief. And if you know Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's um, stages of mourning, you can kind of follow, you know, the anger, the denial, and then the resolution. Um, so at the end of Jacob's Room, for example, when the character, you know, the character walks in and holds up the shoes and says, what about these? You know, it's like life goes on. My, my theory about why she killed herself is that because of the dawn of World War II, she was married to Leonard, you know, who was a Jewish man. She was very concerned about, about losing someone else who was so precious to her in her life. Um, she knew her health was frail. And I think she just literally could not face the idea that, that, that she would have another loss. And so it, she found it easier just to walk into the ooze on March 28th, 1941, um, and just say, you know, that's it. I'm, I'm, it's, you know, it's dangerous to live one day. And I think she, I think that had really come home to her that she just, she just couldn't go on anymore. Um, let's not forget that her birthday, her 139th birthday is Monday. <laughs> just putting yeah. in, that. so on Monday, when you get up, you can bake, bake her a cake. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, can I get in? Let's see. You're yeah. on. Go forward. Good. Um, I'm, re reading, I'm reading this. I'm reading this. I, I was intrigued to read this um, when I saw this seminar. So, and I never actually. I'd read the hour. I'd read the hours, and I saw the hours, but I never actually had read Mrs. Dalloway. But um, just happens that I'm reading this also in the in the context of one having my partner and I read James over the summer for the first time, Ulysses. Um, and so I, I certainly understood what steam of consciousness was there. But I've been also taking a seminar on Proust this year. And I'm, and which is, and the thing that strikes me is just how much Mrs. Dalloway, it's Joyce, uh, what, uh, Virginia Woolf is so much um, more succinct. It's almost crystal clear. The stream of consciousness is so, perfect. Um, if you read James, it's a long-winded kind of process. If you read Proust, which is wonderful, I mean, I recommend Proust heartily, but again, it doesn't, she's much more succinct, much more poetic, much clearer in the way in which she expresses the passage of a day and the way in which the brain sort of moves from thought to thought and past and present and future. Um, and that's what I think was really bowled me over was just how beautifully she and how succinctly she she captures um the process of the mind and so thank you for uh getting me to read it well that's that's a really you've got a lot of stream on your mind i really appreciate your comments 
uh, and uh, your ability to get through Ulysses. Well, we actually we actually got through Ulysses the best way. I think there's a there is a Dartmouth professor that gives kind of one of those talks on tape. I can't remember what the the sponsor of that is. Anyway, so we, we would listen to, we would read a chapter of Ulysses and then we would listen to his lecture on that chapter. And that was really very helpful. It just made it kind of explained what was going on much. Otherwise you find it totally confusing. And also I must say that even Proust, I take a course at the 92nd Street Y. It's a seven month course on the full, all of Proust, which is really quite an extraordinary experience if you to do every two or three years they do that and it's worthwhile it's, it's the only way to do it i think well so. we're lucky virginia doesn't have to consume no. that much we can just keep rereading it and uh, celebrating her but, but i have to say i mean when the 92nd street y curriculum comes out again i'll be looking for a course on virginia, virginia wolf because it made me aware that i want to read more of her and yeah well, that's great. I mean, that's the whole point of why TSL exists, so we can keep throwing those sparks out and keep people intrigued. Uh, these are our passions, and we want to share them with you. Uh, Peter, you got anything you'd like to say? I see you're out there. You're not, are you talking? I just, that, I am Peter. I don't know, maybe you've another Peter. There's another Peter on here, sorry. Okay. I, I don't, I'm not seeing the hands. So anybody who's out there want to chime in, please do. I, can I can I just say something in defense of Joyce? All right. <laughs> I mean, I do love Ulysses, I have to say. Um, I studied Ulysses with Bob Boyle at Marquette University, who was called, you know, bad book spoil because he was an angry Jesuit. Um, and I do love Ulysses. I, I mean, I think I think it's better heard if you can get readings. I mean, the Molly Bloom soliloquy alone is, is extraordinary. So I, I mean, I, and I think part of the reason Virginia didn't, didn't like Ulysses, which was offered to her to print at the Hogarth, Hogarth Press, was she found him a little too common. So some of it she didn't like was Joyce's um, uh, bodiness. I just had to defend Joyce, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, hats off to Joyce, but I do think hearing it definitely changes one's point of view. There is the Irish, uh, accent that's necessary to understand, in my view, to hear it. And I think Virginia has her own rhythm and language that's uh, equal and uh, short and sweet. Yeah, no question. Anyone else out there? Yeah. Claudia Bruce is chiming in here. Does anybody want to talk about the uh, text itself? Technically, how she weaves in the Septimus portion. It's so elegant and I, I'm really having trouble. Um, somebody referenced earlier how he ruined the party. And when I read it the first couple of times, my brain just went to Septimus and then back to the action, well, not the action, but to, to Mrs. Dalloway first person. Can you speak about that, uh, Donna? Uh, I can say something about uh, oh anybody. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Okay, I think uh, Carolee, you do you have a comment on that or Donna, either one? I brought it up, but um, you all. Um, I think that cr the critics often see Septimus as Clarissa's double, in a way oh, okay. that um, you know, like Clarissa, he's living in this internal, sort of this internal oh. world. Um, he's been damaged sort of irre irrevocably um, he hallucinates um, he's also a part he's he he reflects in many ways Virginia Woolf's own experience Virginia Woolf had suffered from mental illness for many years she had attempted suicide before um, there are theories that she might have been bipolar I mean there are a lot of possibilities but I think that um, that um, that need to write um, and that that writing as catharsis for her was was very important, and her writing is I think tied in with those tensions um, that she had. I mean, I think Septimus functions in the book as as the representative of the outside world, the real world, and another victim of patriarchy and war, and and uh, and horror. 
um, that everyone reading that book would have known from World War II, mm -hmm. World War I, because everybody lost somebody in World War I and had that experience and the experience of shell shock particularly. Also, it's a chance to slam the medical establishment, which Virginia Woolf really mm -hmm. wanted to do because she had had very bad experiences with doctors. And Septimus death is announced at her party. Oh, thank you. That was what you asked, I think. Right, exactly. And, and Septimus, um, remember that, that he weaves into the picture, he and, and Clarissa are both in London, you know, in their own particular moments in time, they see the same things, you know, they see the, the plane flying over, which of course also is a, um, you know, reminder of the war, you know, with the planes coming over London and dropping the bombs. So seeing that, that white smoke come out is very frightening to people still, you know, in that time period. Um, you know, the other interesting thing is that in those days, people didn't know what PTSD was, you know, that it, it just, you know, that was, people just came back, they were, they were maimed by the war, but they didn't realize about the syndrome, about what was going on. But the fact that Septimus, you know, I, I agree that he really is very much her double, you know, that they're seeing these small moments of life through a very, very different lens, but still experiencing that day in June in London, you know, in the park. And, you know, the fact that they never meet until, you know, they collide at the party, I think is just, is so important. Claudia, you want to say something? Um, yes. Oh, that's because we're in the same room. Go ahead. Uh, one of the things that struck me on this reading is your are your is your volume are you oh my volume sound on? No, my volume is now up. Can you hear me? Your sound? Yep. Sound. Okay. okay. If you can anyway, what struck me this time around was her weave. How she weaves so many things together in such a short, short period of time. I mean, this is two pages of something that I was, uh, I was working on with Linda. And in those two pages, it, it is just uh, braids of color, of time, of sounds, of tempo. And then as you read more and more in the book, the weaving of class and her, it seemed to me that her, when I was thinking about her suicide also as I was rereading it, it seems to me that she explains herself uh, through Septimus. If you read, if you're reading his thoughts and I'm going, my goodness, this is what she was experiencing. She was hearing voices. She was seeing people in her own life mm -hmm. and she wrote it out through Septimus, through his using his voice. Um, and going back to the war and how when people came home from World War I and the doctors, I think the, there was a phrase, you know, you just soldier on. You just, uh, you know, what was it? A, a proportion, a matter of proportion, not depression and not, uh, not uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. But you just, you know, you just had to pull yourself up and, and soldier on. But her understanding of that shell shock in her own life, I think is just so beautifully written in Septimus. And the fact that at the end, she celebrates in her mind the fact that he takes his own life because it shows, I'm not sure if I'm getting this right, but it shows the fact that he acted he acted positively for himself by choosing this way to end his life. That's all I have to say. So uh, since Claudia just spoke, I wanna ask Jeff, we've prepared a, a, a short reading of Dalloway today, if you bear with us and give us a little patience here. Jeff is gonna stream the, the short piece that Claudia recorded for this event today. So it's coming. Jeff will be putting it up soon. Hold on. Here we go.
like a nun withdrawing or a child exploring a tower, she, Clarissa, went upstairs, paused at the window, came to the bathroom. There was the green linoleum and a tap dripping. There was an emptiness about the heart of life, an attic room. Women must put off their rich apparel. At midday, they must disrobe. She pierced the pincushion and laid her feathered yellow hat on the bed. The sheets were clean, tight stretched in a broad white band from side to side. Narrower and narrower would her bed be. The candle was half burnt down and she had read deep in Baron Marbo's memoirs. She had read late at night of the retreat from Moscow for the House of Parliament sat so long that Richard insisted after her illness that she must sleep undisturbed. And really, she preferred to read of the retreat from Moscow. He knew it. So the room was an attic, the bed narrow, and lying there reading, for she slept badly. She could not dispel a virginity preserved through childbirth, which clung to her like a sheet. Lovely in girlhood, suddenly there came a moment, for example, on the river beneath the woods at Clydeham, when through some contraction of this cold spirit, she had failed him. And then again at Constantinople, and again, and again. She could see what she lacked. It was not beauty. It was not mind. It was something central which permeated, something warm which broke up surfaces and rippled the cold contact of man and woman or of women together. For that, she could dimly perceive. She resented it had a scruple picked up heaven and square, or as she felt, sent by nature, who is invariably wise. Yet she could not resist sometimes, yielding to the charm of a woman, not a girl, of a woman confessing, as to her they often did, some scrape, some folly. And whether it was pity or their beauty or that she was older or some accident, like a faint scent or a violin next door. So strange is the power of sounds at certain moments. She did undoubtedly then feel what men felt. Only for a moment, but it was enough. It was a sudden revelation, a tinge like a blush, which one tried to check. And then as it spread, one yielded to its expansion and rushed to the father's verge, and there quivered and felt the world come closer, swollen with some astonishing significance, some pressure of rapture which split its thin skin and gushed and poured with an extraordinary alleviation over the cracks and sores. Then, for that moment, she had seen an illumination, a match burning in a crocus, an inner meaning almost expressed. But the close withdrew, the heart softened. It was over, the moment. Against such moments, the women too, there contrasted, as she laid her hat down, the bed and barren marble and the candle half burnt. Lying awake, the floor creaked. The lit house was suddenly darkened, and if she raised her head, she could just hear the click of the handle released as gently as possible by Richard, who slipped upstairs in his socks, and then as often as not, dropped his hot water bottle and swore how she laughed. But this question of love, she thought, putting her coat away, this falling in love with women. Take Sally Seaton, 
her relation in the old days with Sally Seaton. And not that, after all, in love. When they did that, that adds to the sound. Mm -hmm. Just want to say, oh, sorry, Linda, Linda and I are contrasting, that this uh, was the first book cover, and it was designed, can you see that on my computer? Uh, this, it was designed by uh, Vanessa Bell, her sister. I just wanted to say that. Okay. Well, I thank you, Claudia. Any other comments out there? Uh, anybody want to chime in? Diane Young? Not sure. I can't see. <clears throat> it's Carla. Oh. Carla. I just want to say I, I've never read Mrs. Uh, Galloway, but now I want to. So that's going to be on my, on my list. It was uh, enticing. It's just been a great uh, series of conversations. Uh, just for the last 40 minutes. So thank you. Terrific. Anyone else comment out there? I, I think what the, the passage that Claudia read, um, there is so much to unpack there. And, you know, starting with that narrow bed, you know, on which she sleeps. I'd like some people to, to comment on that. I, I think that's so incredibly telling about how Clarissa felt about her life at that moment. You know, I agree with you. I think that the narrowness of the bed, the, uh, at, she goes upstairs, she's upstairs, she's away. It harkens back to a room of one's own. It is her space. Uh, she hears the click of the handle, uh, the, the, the just sort of state that she's in is extremely interesting. Uh, her being alone and being able to focus on herself is, uh, you know, it's like the nun's room, honestly. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Donna, gets. I was just gonna say, it's also, it's described as like a coffin, isn't it? That the, the bed will get narrower and narrower. It's, so, it's sort of a, a premonition of death in a way. And we should remember that Clarissa Dalloway had been ill, you know, that she, she that's alluded to, that she had been quite ill with, with well, it's some kind of heart issue, which can be read on so many levels also. Um, it's also one of the things my students related to was what they called the superficiality of society life. You know, that she's caught as the wife of, of Richard Dalloway in this world of um, small things and small slights. You know, that she isn't able to be in the world um, in a way that her daughter is going to be or the next generation is going to be. So she sort of represents that sort of wife of privileged people who manages to find sort of art in a dinner party. So her, her act of art is drawing people together at the dinner party, not writing or painting or doing art in the way that, you know, Virginia Woolf wanted to do. Um, so it's, there's so many levels in the book. Also ultimately comes to what is love and brings in Sally Seton and that quizzing of that relationship comes up in that room and that silence and her space. She's allowed to open up to this passion that is no longer there, but doesn't go away. I think it's beautiful. Hi. I love that section. It's very difficult. And the idea that she's reading uh, the memoirs of Marbeau is quite uh, for relaxation. Marbeau was, I think, wounded, I don't know how many times in battles, <laughs> 13 times. I mean, he's just sort of an amazing uh, survivor. Anyway, I'll be quiet now. Who's out there? 
Yeah, this is Brendan Quinn. Uh, the Peter Walsh character is, is somewhat confusing. I mean, uh, like, why is he there? You know, <laughs> uh, you know, she has Sally Seton, which seems to be the great love of her life, but then this Peter Walsh kind of comes in and this awkward kind of thing. I mean, like, you know, <laughs> like here's an old old lover showing up, just you know, dropping in after being away for years. I mean, most people would be like, you know, what's this guy doing here, right? I mean, uh, but she seems to accept it. And it, it doesn't see, and then she sends him a note to come to the party, right? Um, or, or thanking him for coming. I forget what it was, but she sent him a little letter. Uh, so, you know, his, and he's got the Irish name, you know. Um, so I don't know if that, you know, maybe I'm just sensitive to that. But, uh, plus, I know somebody named Peter Wall, so it kind of uh, touches me further. But I'm just confused by that character. Like, why, you know, if someone could, you know, maybe expound on that, give their thoughts on that. Diane, are you up for some conversation or you just don't want to leave you out? Carol Lee, you got a comment on Peter Walsh, my wolf scholars here? <laughs> well, Peter Walsh, of course, is, you know, someone that she could have married, you know, and she, instead, you know, she chose Richard. So there's a question there about, you know, her motivation, you know, was she, you know, forced into to marrying Richard because society demanded it, you know, the way that she was reared, you know, whatever. I mean, she certainly wasn't, you know, reared like Mrs. Kilman, Miss Kilman. Um, but, you know, Peter Walsh is, is really her foil in a way. I mean, he calls her out. You know, he calls her the perfect hostess, right? So, and of course she is because of whom she marries. So we have to think about how her life might have changed had she married Peter Walsh or Sally Seton for that matter. You know, she had these two people whom she really loved. You know, they were both at Burton with her. Um, you know, she has these incredibly fond memories of, of being, you know, at the, at the sea with them and, you know, what happens. Um, so he, you know, he comes, he comes back, I think, as, as you know, kind of someone to, um, you know, he, he both gets under her skin and at the same time really makes her think, you know, I mean, he's, he's really, he's really there to, um, you know, he needles her and, and he does it purposefully and um, makes her see herself, you know, for what, what she is and what, what's happened in her life. So I'm going to throw this at the scholars here. What's the deal with the pocket knife? Peter Walsh's pocket knife. <laughs> it's a symbol, Linda. <laughs> I'm so glad you asked that question. I had the same question. <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let the, uh, the professor um, uh, <laughs> uh, take that, that, that. I don't know whether they talked about that in their, their class or not, but it is, it is a symbol. <laughs> well, I guess you could say sometimes the pocket knife is just a pocket knife. But I think in this case, it isn't. Um, I mean, I think there's all kinds of questions about sexuality and about impotence and, and all kinds of things going on. Um, it's also interesting, he wasn't, he wasn't sort of brave enough to pursue Clarissa. You know, the book is also about missed opportunities, isn't it? Like missed connections and missed um, loves. Uh, and I think that's an example. Um, he, he, he's still in love with Clarissa on some level. He's fascinated by her, but he wasn't Richard. Richard stepped up. Richard was the, was the British, uh, you know, upper class uh, person. He got the prize. Yeah. Richard was safe. He was, he for her. Was, he was yeah. safe for her. Yeah. yeah. Isn't is Peter about to marry? Oh yes, and and much to um, Clarissa's disgust, you know, when, when she hears about it. I, I think in part because she, he's marrying someone from India, which you know I think you know rankled her tremendously. Um, and as we know, as you as you pointed out, Linda, at the beginning in the history, you know that Gand, uh, you know that that the India had just transferred, you know, its its leadership. Um, but you know, clearly there 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 was friction there, you know, between England and and India. Also, I want to say, Linda and I, Linda and I, Linda and I are in the same room. But I just also wanted to uh, re remember that when Peter came to visit Clarissa after he got back from India, 
he's he has his pocket knife, but she has the scissors. She's uh, she's right. where, you know she's fixing her dress for the party, her green dress. She in that one scene that I read, it all takes place while she is taking the pen from her hat, puts the pen in the in the pen cushion, takes off the hat, puts it on the bed, goes along, then she takes off her coat and intertwined in that that movement, that action, is all of this other drama that is going on and the and the weaving of Peter and Sally and Clarissa and Richard. Uh, that's that's another one of those uh, <coughs> opening moments that, that I, I was th I've been thinking about since reading. I mean, there is so much in this book that you can just go on and on and on and on. I also read um, something interesting that uh, the people who were readers who, who, who read like Shakespeare, uh, that was Septimus, Clarissa, Peter, uh, Sally, and then the people who were the more staid characters, Richard and the, the people who, you know, the other people who came to the party, the doctor, um, that, that is also a contrast. That is also a weaving in the picture. And of course, I mentioned before, the whole thing about class and who goes to war and who doesn't. Just another comment. Same as today. Same mm. as today. <laughs> the other interesting thing is that that the wolves um, leave London <coughs> and go to Richmond, um, which is down the Thames, a, 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 you know, a, a distance, a little bit of a distance anyway. Um, and it's there, you know, in order to keep Virginia busy because of because she's been ill um, and she wants to write, you know, they start the Hogarth Press and that started, you know, in Richmond. Um, and it's interesting because there are, there are many um, people who ignore that part of her life, you know, being in Richmond, which is, it's so similar now when you think <clears throat> of people who are coming up to the Hudson Valley to, to Hudson yeah. from New York City, you know, leaving, leaving the, the urban environment to come up, you know, to where we live. Um, very, very similar kind of thing. And just so at Richmond, her creativity really flourished. Um, in fact, I believe she wrote Mrs. Dalloway, you know, when she was in Richmond, um, you know, she had finished Jacob's Room and then she went on to, you know, to write uh, Mrs. Dalloway. Um, so it was a time of, of incredible heightened creativity for her when they were living there. She, she had created the Dalloways before. Richard Dalloway and Clarissa are characters in The Voyage Out. That, exactly, which and isn't then, uh, so it's her, the first yeah. novel. So yeah. it's interesting how she revisits that and and broadens them out, and makes Clarissa the center, yeah. um, and goes into their lives. I want to say something about Richard too, because Richard's an interesting character because Richard allows Clarissa the freedom that Peter wouldn't have allowed her in some ways, right? Yeah. Because because Richard is at work and he loves her in his way. But he's more distant. He is more distant, but his being distant gives her some freedom. Peter might have engulfed her, if you think about it. Yeah. Who's needier than Peter? Right. It's interesting, the, di the, the marriage dynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you teach again? Uh, I'm retired, but I taught at William Patterson University. In New Jersey. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. So it sounds like this uh, dialogue discussion. Maybe we have to come back and revisit some of the other books. We have such a great group here. So just to put that out there, I don't want to discourage mm -hmm. people from falling in love more and more and more with Virginia Woolf. I mean, mm -hmm. it's all a big, big novel. They all tie together. It's hard to separate them. So that's just my aside. Anybody else want to say something? We're, I, we're I, just want to, I just want to put in a plug for her nonfiction. Um, she was a, an, a vor voracious reviewer and essayist, but her both books, um, A Room of One's Own and Three Guineas, 
are terrific. And I particularly, A Room of One's Own, we all sort of know about women writers. And, oh, but yes. three, three Guineas is a fabulous piece and very relevant now because one of the sections is, is about fascism because that's one of the things it's, it's written in the, I think it was published in maybe the late thirties. So, so she saw Franco and she saw what was happening and she talks about the rise of fascism and it's, a, it's an extraordinary piece. Three guineas, I would, I would recommend it. Yeah, John. I'm, gonna add one, I'm gonna add one more, which is if you've never read the, the memoirs of Leonard Wolf, her husband, yes. they're about, they're six short volumes and they're wonderful, they, his whole life. But of course, the first couple relate to him when he was single, but then the rest are when he was running Hogarth Press with her. It's worth, they're worth reading, they're fun, very interesting. And for some subtext, it's it's absolutely astonishing to read both her letters and her diaries. Um, you know, specifically if you want to look up the, this particular time period, you know, when she was writing Dalloway, or when we get into our next discussion, whether it's the waves or I'm putting in a plug for to the lighthouse. Um, but you know, having that that companion about <laughs> what she's thinking you know, in her diaries, in her letters, and then you, you translate that into what happens, you know, in the novel. It's really fascinating. Now I want to chime in. I think the essays, uh, there's so much great work besides the novels. And I am, I would be willing to do To the Lighthouse. It's my absolute favorite. Yeah, me too. I vote for The Lighthouse. <laughs> so, it's Love. the discussion it's been so exciting to have everybody so enthused and yeah. excited and so much information this, this is wonderful thank you linda thank you so thank much. you claudia we have, you know we have the tsl is uh, expanding all the time we've got tons of books in the tsl we've opened uh used book space downstairs so oh, great there's some there's some wolf down there uh <laughs> so if you're in the mood to stop by Anybody else want to chime in? I want to cut you short, but I don't want to consume. This is we're clocking into an hour almost. So anyone else? Um, I just want to say that I'm um, very much inspired to uh, go back and read uh, Virginia Woolf. This was really wonderful. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so Bye. much for organizing this. Thank you. Bye. Thank You're you. welcome, everybody. Thanks all. Any other takers here before we say goodbye? And uh, we'll be back at you. And uh, maybe part two will be to the lighthouse. You Let's could do, do a combination of. Uh... <laughs> say it again. A combination Willa Cather and Virginia Woolf type of thing. <laughs> I'm into Willa Cather. She's a terrific writer. That would be a good combination. All right, last call out there, Lan Ying. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. I'm from Albany. It seems every one of you are from Hudson. <laughs> I, I, I was a regular goer when the, uh, before the shutdown, the TSL. And uh, I read this uh, Mrs. Stanaway, but from what you, every one of you have more details. So I'm going to go back to read again. And I read the other ones. So I hope you will continue and I will definitely join the group. Thank you. Well, just to comment, we have a huge Albany audience and we miss you terribly. And this is really one way to reach out again to keep you uh, in our, uh, embrace we're very much alive and here and we're just uh so sad that we can't be together but this is the best we can do at this time and to the lighthouse will be next i'm not sure what date we will do it we need to get time to read it again so last call out there yeah uh linda let me just add one annotation uh i stumbled across uh, a three-part series on Vanessa and Virginia, uh, which takes place in the pre-World War I era, uh, which is on, uh, it's on Amazon Prime. Um, and I thought it was worth a watch. Hey, thank you very much. We'll check that out. Anybody else? Comments? Our biography on Roger Fry, our friend Roger Fry is really good too. I read that. He's a patron writer. That's worthwhile.
Okay, last call. All right, we'll be back to you with the next installment of Virginia Wolf. Really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for your enthusiasm and passion. And uh, we'll see you soon and uh, check out the bookstore and keep in touch. Take care. Yeah, please Bye. send the text when you do it again. Thank you.